without further ado, uh, we have the great honor today. We've been working on uh, having this presenter uh, speak and be part of this lecture series for a number of years. And for whatever reason, schedules didn't quite align. Um, Dr. John Pyatt, not only is he a brilliant researcher, but he's also a gifted storyteller. So we are all in for a treat. By his own admission, he uh, was hooked on seabirds um, a couple of decades, well, quite a few decades ago. And his skilled research has really set, set the groundwork for really understanding the relationship between species in this challenging time of climate change. And so in particular, his interest in looking at the interrelationships between seabirds and forage fish and humans is really groundbreaking and is helping us set a new, a new paradigm for understanding climate change. So without further ado, Dr. John Pyatt, thank you so, so much for doing this. I look forward to this with great appeal. John. Uh, well, okay, can you hear me? We can. And can you see the slideshow? Yes. Can you see a puffin? Okay, um, well, thanks very much. I appreciate it and I'm happy to, uh, to be here. Um, uh, uh, can you hear me okay? I suddenly stopped hearing you. That, that's because uh, you're speaking and I, I, I muted myself. So <laughs> I'm done okay. until the question answer period, John. So okay, all right. You us, we're here though. We're okay. here in the back, in the wings, if you will, just behind the curtain over to the left. Okay, very good. All right, well, thanks. And uh, so, yeah, today I want to talk about uh, what puffins and other seabirds, to be honest, can tell us about uh, the impact of climate change on marine ecosystems. Um, and, um, and just as a, a primer, you know, some people may wonder why we study seabirds in the first place. Um, and the answer is that, uh, well, they're marine wildlife that deserve uh, our respect and care, like you know, all the rest of those animals out there that we um, impinge on. Uh, but legally, we're required by Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1918 to, to conserve and protect seabird populations, and all migratory bird populations. And this, is, this comes under the umbrella of the Department of the Interior which uh, houses the, the different agencies, Fish and Wildlife Service, Park Service, and Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, USGS, um, the first three being managers of wildlife and, and habitat, and USGS being more research branch. Uh, there's other folks. NOAA uh, has interests um, in, of course, in seabirds and bycatch issues and, and uh, uh, ecological issues re regarding seabirds. Uh, but most of the management um, per se is happening within the Department of Interior. And, um, but, you know, myself and the people who work with me, we, we really do think of these as special creatures and we just feel privileged to be able to study their biology and, and monitor the health of their populations. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about that, their biology behavior and, and et cetera. And uh, I, wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, I mean, we learn lots of things about them, but we also learn from them. And so I'm going to hit some of those highlights. Um, for example, seabirds and, and uh, puffins in particular are great sen uh, sentinels for monitoring the health of marine ecosystems. Um, they are, I mean, we don't, may not think about this very much, but, but um, you know, a lot of what happens in the ocean happens, you know, out of sight and out of sight and out of mind. Uh, it's really hard to get down there and study fish and plankton and stuff on the bottom and things moving around. Uh, we use some of the tools like acoustics, but seabirds are, are great. Uh, they're visible, they're common. Uh, they, they depend entirely on marine food. So, you know, if things are happening to them, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a red flag. They're, many of them, most of them are colonial. And so they're pretty easy 
relatively speaking, to study into colonies. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and so, they gather food around their colonies, uh, which uh, may include thousands or even tens of thousands of square miles of open ocean area around their colony. So when we yeah. sample the matter colonies, we, we, um, we uh, the, um, the, we're, the guests are not being able to see the um, slides. So are you still on, what can Puffins tell us about the impact of climate change? Okay, I see. I was I'm I'm clicking the wrong buttons for you guys. Sorry. Okay, that will be okay now. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm going back behind the curtain. Yeah. Well, that was good. <laughs> I'm glad you came out there. So, um, so as I was saying, we we um, um, we. Um, these birds are great sentinels uh, for telling us what's going on out there in the ocean. Uh, they gather food around their colonies um, at great distances. And so they're like uh, little mini trawlers. You know, we send them out, they catch fish, they bring them back to a central point. We just have to collect them. And I'll show you a little bit about that. Um, and they have high metabolic rates. So they are like the canaries in the coal mine. And I'll talk a little more about that too. Um, but I, just to back up and sort of like, you know, um, I just want to talk a little bit about why we study forage fish, seabirds and forage fish together. Um, it all started uh, quite some time ago when I lived in Newfoundland. And in the spring of 82, there was a story that came out in Equinox, which was Canada's sort of equivalent to National Geo at the time. Um, and um, a story came out about the puffins in Whitless Bay seabird colonies, the biggest puffin colony on the Atlantic coast, uh, just south of St. John's. And the populations were, were having a hard time breeding and you know, were being damaged. And they, were, they blamed it on overfishing, offshore overfishing by the Russians who were still allowed to fish on the continental shelf. Uh, uh, that changed, but at the time uh, there was concern. And they were mostly fishing capelin, not for food for themselves, but for meal to be able to grind up and use to feed animals back in Russia. So there was a lot of controversy about all of this. Um, uh, at the time, I just happened to be studying the bycatch of seabirds in fishing gear with uh, contracts from the Canadian Wildlife Service. And um, I and I was already, I had bought myself a small boat and, um, and some acoustic equipment. And I was out there trying to assess how much forage fish was in the water. The, the, the main fish there being the capelin, which is a marine smelt, you know, to look at when it arrives near shore. And, and, and I was looking at um, uh, whether, you know, how the birds were consuming those prey. And I got a lot of stomachs. You can see me here on um, a rather messy job. All of the, a lot of the birds that got caught in nets came back to the, to the shore and I got stomachs out of those birds, salvaged the stomachs and, and looked at what they were eating. Uh, and mostly it was Cape one, but it, it's, uh, anyway, I was already doing this. And, um, and when that article came out, then um, some money suddenly became available uh, from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada and um, to do a study of, you know, looking at seabirds and forage fish together. And I, I know it was one of those, you're in the right place at the right time and a bit of good luck strikes. Um, and so uh, now 40 years later, I'm still doing the same thing, uh, and uh, except uh, I have a lot more help um, and people who actually, you know, are fisheries biologists, for example, um, and equipment. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we study oceanography, plankton, nutrients, you know, fish, uh, birds, whales, um, and uh, the, the whole system. And, um, and, and I just want to make that point is, you know, you, you might ask, well, why are you still just, you know, doing the same thing? Um, and I, my answer is, well, okay, let's just back out for a second and look at factors that influence seabird populations. Most of the time I get questions about seabirds. It's, it's generally the biggest question I get from management agencies, for example, is why are the seabirds declining? Um, nobody ever asked me why they're increasing. They just want to know why they're, they're declining a particular place or they're threatened or endangered or you know, there's some issue. And, and oftentimes, um, you know, the concern is that there's been some human impact that would influence populations. So, so 
you know, there are a lot of uh, human impacts on seabirds in Alaska and Washington and the whole West Coast. Um, and things like pollution, oil pollution, uh, uh, you know, toxic chemicals, fisheries removals, either of the forage species or of the larger predatory fish that eat the forage species. Uh, fisheries bycatch still happens uh, a lot in both oceans. Uh, that disturbance from vessels and, and uh, you know, in uh, uh, either from tourists, tour, tour ships or, or just heavy vessel traffic areas and, have, and ensuing habitat degradation. Hunting of seabirds is still um, fairly common on the East Coast in Newfoundland. They take upwards of, you know, a quarter million murs every year um, for food. And in Alaska, the uh, uh, Native American population uh, uh, on many of the islands up there still eat seabirds. And, uh, and then there's global warming, uh, which is not sort of the natural situation uh, above and beyond the natural climate variability. On the natural impact side, there's, um, um, you know, there's, we know there's many things that affect these birds. There's predation, uh, there's changes in their food webs, uh, competition with, you know, whales and predatory fish, and there's disease and biotoxins sometimes cause die-offs. And then there's climate cycles, um, which I will talk about. There's a picture of one here at the bottom, um, sort of, a, you know, changing temperatures that, you know, they go up for a while, they go down for a while. Um, and then, you know, um, just to add a little flavor to it, some of these things cross over, they're interactive. Sometimes pollution changes the, the ocean and uh, makes it, you know, biotoxins more able to grow. And so you have a interaction there. Um, we, we, if we do fishes removals, we change the food webs. Uh, if, we're, if there's predation on the seabird colonies and, and we're hunting them, you know, that's doubling up on the, the mortality of adult birds, which is, 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 is uh, not good for the population. Um, and then again, there's interaction with competition in fisheries removals and climate cycles and global warming are related and some of the cycles are being interrupted or disrupted by, you know, the sort of continuous warming. So uh, all of that makes things really complicated. So I'm going to take a second here to try and focus it a little bit because those things seem to be all scattered and all over the place and, then and to some degree they are. Certainly managing it, it seems very scattered at times. But um, the way that we kind of, when you, when you look at it carefully, you see that, that there's the seabirds in their ocean environment, and that's the blue oval here in this, in this diagram. Um, and you know, so this is the ocean, seabirds are out there, some of the higher predators that live with them, like large cod and large flounder that eat the same prey. Um, uh, uh, they're feeding on this forage base, which could include forage, the typical forage fish we think of like smelt and capelin and uh, sand lance and, and the juvenile uh, age classes, the small uh, age classes of pollock and cod are very commonly eaten. So there's a, a forage base that depends on primary and secondary, et cetera, production. Um, and, um, and then the seabirds, and they're all in this marine environment. Uh, on the right in the purple is the sort of the human uh, side of things is as we just discussed some of the you know the interactions with commercial fisheries and contaminants of the human direct human impacts and then at the bottom is the in the green is sort of the the, the global climate issues um, climate warming climate shifts regime shifts and then what we call anomalous events um, and so these are sort of operating from outside the ocean but they're, they're Im impacting. Now, when you look at this, I mean, the, 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 it's a simple diagram, a little, a little bit confusing, but, but I would just point out, for example, look at the green line coming from, from the climate change you know, up to the seabirds. You know, the indication here is that climate can directly affect seabirds. It can, uh, it can, it can uh, lots, when the rain, when you get too much rain, for example, unusual amounts of rainfall, you can flood the burrows of puffins at their colonies and make it unsuitable for, for reproductive success. Um, there are places now in the world where, where seabirds that, that breed on the shoreline at sea level are now, they're losing their habitat to rising seas. Uh, so there's direct effects. Likewise, we can see direct effects of contaminants, this pr purple line going straight to seabirds, and that could be oil spill, oil pollution, and you've seen, everybody's seen pictures of that or, or even seen it in, in, in the real world. 
Um, and then commercial fisheries, well, we have uh, bycatch, you know, directly of seabirds or on long lines and nets. So these are all direct impacts. But um, you also note here that these, you see all these other arrows that are coming from the forage base to seabirds. These are, this is where a lot of these outside influences really have their influence. So with cyclical, uh, with climate change, the red arrow, you, it affects the entire water mass. It changes the currents, it changes the, the productivity, it changes the temperatures. And so it has an impact on the higher predators, but it also affects which, and, and it affects the forage base. And, the forage, and therefore the red arrow you see coming from forage base to seabirds is an extension of this arrow of climate, but it's going through the forage base. Likewise, commercial fisheries uh, affects the, could affect the forage base and therefore the seabirds. Uh, same with contaminants. You can have contaminants that influence the forage base, uh, reduce populations, therefore the seabirds. Uh, and, um, and the black line is really, and then the forage base can just have its own problems. You know, forage fish have their, you know, uh, they may have disease, they may have other issues that come up that have nothing to do with these other things. And their populations may just fluctuate naturally, and they do. So the seabirds, basically, you see where food supply, the forage base is really where much of uh, uh, the impacts are happening. Uh, even if you see, you know, you may see things visually, um, uh, this, it's this more subtle, you know, work that takes place going through the forage base. And that's why, that's why we spend so much time studying this relationship. And I would say that, you know, um, it's complicated uh, for sure, but at least pelagic food webs actually can be fairly straightforward. There's, um, you know, there's, there's a few dominant species uh, and, and taxa groups, large predatory fish like cod and, and salmon and uh, large marine mammals, the whales and sea lions and seals, and then seabirds. Um, and, uh, and they all eat, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot of overlap in what they eat. So uh, these systems are, you know, could be uh, even more difficult to study if, you know, the, uh, more players are, I mean, they can certainly get complicated, but I guess I just want to say that we, um, it's doable. And we, we study whales, we study, we study the fish we, and, um, and the birds and the oceanography, and you, you, can, you can put those things together and make some sense out of it. So um, going further in, on then, I just, you know, again, we're, I'm focused on the forage fish at the moment. And um, I just want to make some points here because I don't know that people really, you know, we talk about all these animals as if they're all the same, you know, um, uh, that, I mean, we know, I mean, I, I know you know a whale's different from a fish, but in terms of their predation, you say, well, they're all eating the same food, yeah, but they're eating the same food in different ways and they have different, uh, very special, uh, different requirements that really uh, makes interpretation of what happens to them when things change, like critical. If you wanna understand why, you know, one thing changes and another doesn't, you need to understand the differences between these predators. Similarity here is that they're all eating this, in this ex simple example, but there's plenty of places in the world where it's true, all these predators are eating this, exactly the same prey um, at this time. And that's not unusual. These schooling fish, there's, you know, they, they may form very large schools that attract all of these predators at the same time. And so there's a lot of overlap in space and time at, at times. Um, and so this scenario right here is fairly uh, common. And so we have a 30,000 kilogram humpback whale that's uh, um, obviously very big and you know presumably needs a lot of food and a two kilogram cod, pretty good sized fish and a, a one kilogram mer. And you know, just as a simple sort of breakdown of species, birds, mammals, and then we have the forage fish themselves. Um, now, um, when, you, when you look at their consumption needs, not surprisingly, you know, the, the humpback whale needs to eat a lot of food. It needs to eat 500 kilograms a day, it's half a ton. The myrrh uh, needs to eat 0.4 kilograms a day, um, which is a fair bit. And then the, the, poly, the cod uh, only needs to eat 0 0.02 kilograms per day. And so you see that I've switched the order here now. The, the cod now has been diminished in size from where I had it before as being dominant. 
uh, over the, the myrrh. Now it's, it's diminished. And the reason is because it's a cold blooded species. And despite being twice the size of the myrrh, it eats an order of magnitude less food. So order of magnitude being tenfold. So it, it's approximately. It, it, and that's true of all the fish. They're all cold blooded. And, and so are the plankton and, and the zooplankton and all the other organisms that live in the ocean, except for the mammals and the birds. They're all cold blooded. And so this, is a, this has huge ramifications for their biology. And starting with how much they have to eat. So, um, so if we look at this again, let's talk about it in terms of percent of body mass, because that's kind of puts it in perspective. Um, and in this scenario, the myrrh suddenly takes, is the dominant one out there in the sense that it needs to eat 30 to 50% of its body mass every day. So you gotta let that sink in a little bit. If you had to eat 50% of your body mass every day, um, you'd be spending all day long eating and digesting. And that's pretty much what seabirds do. They have a very fast metabolic rate. They can digest food really fast and they're just cranking it all day long. I mean, they're in this cold water and they're diving to depths of 200 meters and they're you know, seeking out, they're flying hundreds of kilometers and uh, they're looking for food and they're finding it, diving, catching it, eating it, sitting around for a little while and starting all over again all day long, 365 days a year. It's an incredibly stressful, I would think, <laughs> if I had to do that, I certainly would be stressed out. You'd be like, it's not a matter of, uh, you know, so it, it's a very different perspective for humans. We eat three to 6% and we can, you know, we can get by for a while, but you know, we can, we can get by without a meal for a while. Um, uh, and whales only eat one to 2% of their body mass. So they can get by for quite a while. And that, and their strategy is to sort of move along the coast, migrate over great air lengths, uh, distances to find really good patches of food and then stay there and pig out for as long as it takes to like really get bloated and then maybe move on to look for some new areas. Um, and they can do that because they only they only need one to 2% on a, in a given day. Fish, uh, large predatory fish like cod and, and arrowtooth flounder and pollock and hake and uh, all kinds of uh, large uh, species, they only need to eat approximately 0.5 to 1% of their body mass. Um, and so they can actually go um, many days or weeks between meals. And um, uh, so they, they're much less, uh, say, you know, stressed on a day-to-day -day basis about getting that food. If mers and puffins don't get a food, any food whatsoever in three or four or five days, they're dead. So it's a different perspective. Uh, whales can travel for long periods of time between patches. They need to find them. They need to get those patches eventually. And they gotta be big ones, but they can sure last quite a while. Uh, and certainly the fish can, but the birds, they really, uh, they, they, are, they are just, uh, they're cranked up and uh, they've, got to, they've got to feed that demand every day. Otherwise they're in big trouble. Um, all that said, predatory fish are still, you know, the most abundant thing out there. So in terms of the, the gorilla on the block, there's, you know, and this example is like Gulf of Alaska approximations of, you know, how many uh, fish or, or animals are out there. Well, there's hundreds of, you know, probably hundreds of millions of cod um, and there's only millions of mers and there's thousands of whales and there's probably billions of forage fish. Um, but, the, but the predatory fish are, you know, in terms of the other predators, the competing predators are, you know, far outnumber, you know, the, 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 um, the birds and the whales. But then there's that metabolism thing. So you have to sort of, if you plug that in, what you find out is that approximately, um, you know, these large predatory fish out of, you know, in this scenario, and I'm just using numbers from the Gulf of Alaska and, and proximate numbers, just for to look at the relative importance, you see that that these large predatory fish would probably have to eat, um, you know, close to a billion uh, small fish, you know, 0.75 billion or 750,000, you know, a million, 750 million fish 
uh, MERS, you know, their entire population in the Gulf of Alaska might have to eat something like, you know, 0.2 billion. But the whales now also have to eat approximately 2.2 billion. They don't have to eat it as frequently, um, but, they, but they do have to eat similar to what the MERS eat. So those two now have become sort of on par. And this ratio, this is for a particular area, and I'm just using some numbers I had. Um, but this ratio of the, the ground fish, you know, sort of out consuming birds and whales combined is actually pretty typical of most uh, continental shelf systems in the, in the Northern hemisphere, at least. Um, so you'd see the same thing in Norway and Georgia's bank and on the Grand Banks and, you know, the Barren Sea and, and the North Sea, um, uh, California coast. These are these kind of relationships, the predatory fish, they, they just outnumber you know, our birds and, and whales. And so, um, so I, I, I hopefully this will become apparent why that's critical to understand the difference between these species. Um, and so if we, you know, you know, where does this information plug into um, sort of the management of the bird populations or what, what we may take as an indication of what's happening in the system? Um, I would just point out that some of these some of the relationships are pretty are pretty fundamental relationships that you see between a lot of different species. Uh, we worked on a project some years ago with colleagues around the world, uh, where where there were databases on birds and food supply adjacent stocks of fish, so that you could look at how were the birds doing relative to a certain amount of food uh, breeding success. And so we 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 looked around the world and. Uh, gathered that data and pulled it together uh, and analyzed it. And on this graphic on the left, is, this is this is the data here are grouped by marine ecosystem, you know, Norwegian Sea, North Sea, Gulf of Alaska, California Current, Benguela um, off of South Africa, New Zealand, and the Scotia Sea in Antarctic. So these, you know, and here's the relationships, which is fairly, these are pretty fundamental predator prey. You can get the same same looking kind of a curve with insects in the laboratory, uh, predator and prey insects. Um, and it's been shown for lots of uh, animals, hard to get for marine systems where it's difficult to measure the prey. But in, in these studies, we were able to get estimates of prey. And, um, and so the interesting thing here is that there's the threshold uh, uh, below which, and, and this is abundance across the bottom, normalized abundance and zero is the sort of long-term average abundance. So uh, around about the long-term average, you know, if birds are in an area where the food is above that level, then they kind of do well, respective, you can add more food to the system, but they don't do any better. They're, because their populations are probably, they're not that big. The, the populations are big enough on average to exploit the average amount of food. So the populations of these birds probably hovers around this average, you know, uh, at a level that allows them to, to do well at an average amount of food and above. Below that, they start having problems and fairly quickly they, their production, you know, tanks to zero. Um, but they, they start having, you only see a relationship between birds and fish, fish abundance and bird breeding success on this side of the, of the curve. On this side of the curve, if you, if you plot breeding success versus food supply, you get a flat line. There is no relationship. Um, and that's because the birds have kind of maxed out. There's enough food, more than enough food for them above this threshold. And, and, whether, and if you look at a whole bunch of different species from penguins to gannets to skuas and, and uh, gulls and fulmars and cormorants and the ox, the, the murres and the puffins and the rhinoceros puffin, uh, uh, we see, um, the same, I mean, the same relationship um, for all these different species. And so this was kind of interesting because it means, you know, birds in general are, uh, we have uh, the ability to infer what kinds of food, how much food they need to have out there, regardless of the system that we're studying. And so, um, so, you know, puffins are, um, are, are fantastic samplers of forage fish stocks. And one of the reasons that we love them so much is because they're just so darn cute. Um, other than that, they also like to carry their fish back to home to the kids uh, in their, they carry in their beaks and they carry whole 
fish and often still alive, really fresh, in great shape, and great condition. So you can actually identify them and, and um, uh, weigh and measure them, get an idea of their quality and their size and how much energy they have. And I mean, there's just a, a lot, as opposed to cutting open stomachs of adults where A, you have to kill them first um, and B, it's, it's messy and C, the prey are decomposed and hard to identify. The, this is great. This is a great way to sample. And so I'm going to take you on a, a, just a little short diversion here of what it's like to sample uh, these puffins in Alaska. Uh, most of the colonies are in remote areas. This is in the Aleutians. And we get there uh, often working with the, the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge that has a vessel that works these waters and works with us. They're, we collaborate with them on these projects all the time to go out and you know, uh, put people ashore on islands that have puffins. And um, um, you wander around looking for holes um, and it's not hard to find them. I mean, we, we go to islands, we know puffins are breeding. Uh, they can uh, be dispersed, but, but often they're quite, uh, they're gathered up. And you can see off to the right, uh, up in the corner here, some red flags, the orange flags. These are places where we've found burrows and, and marked them. And, um, uh, we take, uh, we carry around our backpacks full of little small screens and we, and we plug the holes up with the screens. And, um, and the idea being that the, the adult puffins, we do this, try to do this early as we can in the morning after we get off the ship. And then um, the birds are coming back with uh, meals for the young. And this screen stops them in their tracks and they drop the food and then they leave. So um, uh, we steal that food, I'm embarrassed to say, but, but it's only one of many hundreds of meals that the chicks are gonna get in their lifetime. So we don't feel too bad about it. On islands where we have had people doing repetitive um, captures, we'll often identify the prey, the easy stuff and, uh, and give it back to them. But when you only only take it once, you know, from a one day visit, um, you know, it's not a problem. And while we're waiting for the birds to deliver their foods, and we'll go and uh, do what we call grubbing, which is to sort of get down and get your arms down in those burrows and try and find things. Uh, and this is what you come up with once in a while. Uh, but normally during the daytime at this time, the chicks are, are pretty well are growing up and the adults are both off fishing. If you catch one in there, it's probably because it just it just came in and it's delivered a, a load and and it's uh, getting ready to go um, um, usually. So so um, you know we take them out and then let those go, and and then we get the chick and um, we weigh and measure them, and and then we gawk at them and and um, and how cute they are and take pictures, um, and they are they're just um, something to see. And um, you know, other things we do while we're there is you know, uh, set up study plots or try and go back to ones that have been established by the refuge or uh, uh, you know, ourselves to revisit and look at the densities of burrows and the numbers of birds that are occupying those burrows, et cetera. And as you can see, some of the sites we work at are pretty spectacular. So uh, after we've done those things for a couple of hours, we go back and to the burrow and we find Lo and behold, some food. And here, uh, actually, uh, not a good example of fish because we, we've got um, uh, some squid here. You can see several different squid. There are some fish. It looks like juvenile pollock. Uh, it may even be a small octopus there. And uh, yeah, fish, more fish. So, um, so we would, we would pack you know, those meals up. We, we take all the screens back. We take all the flags down. And, and then we hop in the boat and we head back to the ship where then we have all these things bagged up and, and every, every load gets put in the baggie and we you know, pull them all out and, and then we weigh and measure them and uh, save samples for later analysis. We may do <clears throat> a variety of things that we can do back in the laboratory um, to look at energetics, for example, and how much fat they have, <clears throat> look at their body condition. Um, sort of a sort of as with humans that sort of that index of uh, obesity um, you know it's the index of size over uh, mass divided by size 
and um, and sometimes we try we do some other things with the fish to um, look at stable isotopes, which gives you some idea about food web interactions and et cetera. Um, again, we get nice specimens. There's a, that fish on top is an active mackerel. It's a juvenile from the Western oceans, but you know, nice, really beautiful samples of of the typical forage species. So. Uh, and that was just an example. I mean, that's the kind of you know information you can get from puffins, and not just information, but you actually get the samples of fish. So it really is like going on a fisheries cruise. Uh, instead of using your net, you know, you're using uh, uh, you know all these birds to go and get the fish for you. So on the top graph, you'll see uh, sort of the whole area. I'm sorry, it's kind of a busy graph, but all the blue dots and red dots and yellow dots, that's sort of a, that's abundance of puffins at sea, high being red. So you can see where there's hot spots of, puff, of puffins. The black circles are colonies. And so these are areas that have been sampled either by us or by colleagues, starting at Protection Island, just around the corner for rhinoceros puffins, um, and uh, up to Triangle Island, British Columbia, and then a couple of colonies in Southeast Alaska, and then, Lots of colonies in the Gulf of Alaska and out in the Aleutians. So all the, every one of these black circles is places we've sampled. Um, and go, if you look down in the bottom graph, so this is just showing uh, the composition across this geographic range. And this is, as it shows at the bottom here, this is 3,400 kilometers. So that's a pretty, this is a pretty extensive geographic range. And what you'll see here is you see the, the red and the gold dominate here in the eastern part of the of, of the area. Uh, and that's capelin and sandlands. And these two extremely important prey are the dominant on the shelves here of the northern Gulf of Alaska. As you move west, you start to see a lot more purple. And uh, that is juvenile, mostly juvenile pollock, but some juvenile cod. So by juvenile, we mean they're really just the young of the year. They were eggs three or four months or you know, before they went by a seabird colony and got picked off. And they're about the same size as a small capelin or sandlands. So they're forage fish, even though they grow up eventually to become a large predatory fish. Uh, but for now, they're good forage. And you can see they're widely eaten, uh, especially out here in the Aleutians. And, uh, and then as you get way out into the Aleutians, into the Western part, where there's very little shelf of any kind, it's mostly oceanic islands, just volcanic islands coming up straight out of the sea. You run into some cool stuff. There's a lot more cephalopods here, uh, 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 lots of squid, and you, uh, these Atka mackerel, which are common. Uh, the adults are you know, common and breed in the in the passes uh, between the islands. And you pick up a lot of uh, mesopelagic lanternfish, the ones that live, you know, anywhere from you know 500 to 2,000 meters uh, or more uh, in the water column, and they come up at night to closer to the surface where the puffins can pick them off. So there's an interesting, they're, they're not, you know, not that big a number, but they're incredibly oily, like 50% oil. So they're, they're very rich if you can get them. So there's a, you know, we can describe the food webs over this wide range and we can relate the characteristics of, of these different prey to the oceanography and the environments from which they come to get a better understanding of why these fish are where they are. And I would say that, you know, we've been doing that with a variety of forage species that, that nobody else has really studied very much, partly because these forage species are not commercially fished. And so it's certainly not in juvenile stages and, and uh, certainly some of the other classic forage fish, they don't get much bigger than four or five inches. So um, nobody's fishing those commercially in Alaska. And there's, and therefore there's not really much of a, a uh, uh, effort to study them, but basically because they're not commercial and, you know, they've got their hands full just trying to figure out what's going on with cod and pollock, uh, which are, you know, billion dollar fisheries, but uh, uh, they, and that's where they're, that's where a lot of the research effort goes. They do, they look at the stomachs of a lot of those predatory fish and they see these, for, they get lots of info on forage there. Uh, so they're using predators as samplers as well. Uh, that may be where their best information comes on forage fish, as a matter of fact. So um, anyway, um, and you know, and other things we can do, and I don't expect anybody to really uh, dig into this graphic. I just, I just want to show you that we, we learn some things by looking at over time, 
you know, so we, we see that there's a big spatial trend here and that has to do with environment and habitat and, and the water depth and uh, chlorophyll and productivity. Uh, but over time, you see here, this is Sandlance on this top graph and Cape on the second one here. We see there's a lot of variability. This is a sort of, this, these are deviations from an average. So if they're above the line, then they're more abundant. If they're below the line, they're less abundant uh, than average. And we see, um, uh, I mean, the thing that stands out here is if you look at the black bars mostly, because this, um, uh, this is the most important sort of component of the, the measure. Um, you see that there's a big peak in, in the uh, uh, late 90s and to, to early 2000s for, for satellites, but then a big decline through the 2000s. Um, and with Capelin, we see that their numbers have been reduced all pretty much during this time, again, the black bars, but they became much more abundant in, in the mid 2000s and, and stayed so up until about 2014, 15, which I'll tell you about later. But here, so, um, but you know, it's interesting. These are the two most, two of the most important forage species in the Northern hemisphere, and they seem to have different cycles. And these cycles do relate, in some cases, relate to like the Pacific decadal oscillation. They relate to climatological features of the, of the seascape. And, um, and, and we also see from this that they are definitely adapted for different regimes. Uh, up on top here, this is a, this is a graph of, uh, abundance of, of, of Pacific Sandlands, PSL, versus this PC1 environment, which is essentially largely driven by temperature. So we can sort of look at this as a, uh, you know, relationship between Sandlands and temperature. And you see that here it's, it's positive uh, over a limited range of temperatures. They kind of like the warmer end, they do better. But with Capelin, uh, it's the exact opposite. They actually, they thrive in cooler water and then they and they don't do as well in the in the, in the warmer water, um, and this is why in, in Newfoundland you see it's, it's the waters are colder, and the areas that I initially got started with this, looking at Capelin and, and Puffins, um, they the Capelin there the water temperatures are you know once you get below the thermocline in in midsummer it's four degrees centigrade, uh, so it's because it's getting its its water from the Arctic and so it's a cold environment. Uh, and it, and it, Capelin is the dominant fish. There's sand, there's sand plants there too, but Capelin just completely outweighs the sand lance. So um, I'll just, you know, just a little bit, that was just a little bit about kind of what we, what we are learning from these kind of collections. But the other thing is because these birds are, are, are getting species that, you know, fisheries are not really monitoring by fishery, uh, National Marine Fishery Service, you know, they actually get hold of all this uh, puffin diet data, uh, usually through the maritime refuge, and it's funneled into their system. They have a, uh, this is an old one now, 2013, but uh, since even before this, they were starting to use the actual diets. And this is, these graphics are, are simple, sort of the dotted line is the average. So where you see, you know, uh, these yellow areas, these are places where there was a big boom in uh, abundance of these species. And um, so they're using, they use this as an ecosystem indicator. And uh, it's a lot, and they also look at breeding success because we know breeding success can be related to food supply. So the, the National Marine Fishery Service is now using seabird, you know, chick diet information and breeding success diet, inf uh, breeding success information to uh, manage the fisheries um, uh, to help understand what's going on with the ecosystem. So, I think I'm finally getting to the, the, the climate phase part of this. Um, sorry, probably been taking a little too long here. Um, so, you know, I wanted to get a little bit to what's the link here? So I, I think I've, I hope I've made a, you know, a case for the fact that food supply and bird interactions are really fundamental to understanding what's going on. And if we want to understand climate, how climate affects it, we need to understand climate a little bit too. And uh, that's the thing about seabirds, you kind of got to get into everything um, uh, from the oceanography and the climate to, to plankton and, and uh, uh, the biogeography and interactions and food webs and all the rest of it. But climate cycles in particular can be confusing. Um, I prefer to, you know, I, I, I think we, you know, it's important to understand the differences between cycles and uh, global warming. 
Um, uh, on, on the left-hand side, you can see you know, what are, are well-known climate cycles. Um, and this graph here, these graphs, all these graphs are all the same. The red shows above average and the yellow shows below average temperatures. This is SST, sea surface temperature over here. Um, and zero is the average. And so you see the, uh, with the global, uh, this is El Nino, El Nino Southern Oscillation. Oh, and, and I should say this, this, uh, this is from an older paper, but it was really the first attempt to uh, look at the global water temperatures and um, process the data in a way to, that, that you can pull out the signals that are due to different factors. And it's a complex mathematical procedure, but it, it works quite well. And, and here, what's been, ha what's been done is uh, they were able to, uh, for the entire world, look, look at what the world looks like when it's in an El Nino mode. And you can see here, El Nino, high temperatures you know, at the equator, and it pushes up against the coast, and it makes its way even all the way up to Alaska. Uh, this is the typical El Nino, strong El Nino sort of pulse of warm water. And, um, but, you know, uh, and these cycles are well known and, and we've all lived through um, uh, El Ninos. In fact, we, we've just gone through one or we're going into an El Nino is what, what I heard, another one. Uh, but they typically range from three to four to five to seven years uh, in between. And so you see that here, this is a hundred, you know, this, this is only about, um, 120 year cycle, but we've got 20 more years to add to this and it doesn't look much different. It, it's a repeated cycle. The magnitudes of temperature change are similar. You know, the bigger ones have a stronger magnitude, but in general, these are pretty similar spikes, followed by an El Nino, followed by a La Nina with cold water. And so um, a pretty regular, this looks like a pretty regular cycle. I think for those of us on the ground, you know, living day to day, you're sort of like, oh, is it an El Nino year again? Is this La Nina? Why is it so, why are we getting so much rain? Why is it so cool? Why is it so hot? Um, oftentimes it's El Nino is contributing to that through its effects on ocean temperature. Uh, and it's fairly regular, but it's not always exactly the same number of years in between. Um, at, at a larger scale, there's the inter, there's the, what in this analysis was called the Pacific interdecadal mode, um, which is to say that there's a signal that occurs on a, on a, not just an annual scale like these, because with these, the El Nino, El Nino hits and then it disappears a year, you know, within the year, and then it usually goes to a La Nina. So that the the event is a year, uh, but then there are there are there's there's cycles where the temperatures get warm for a decade or two, and, and they get cool for a decade or two, and. This record, this is for the ocean, this is, this is for, you know, where since we've been measuring ocean temperature, we have a record, but we've, we've gone to, not we, but, you know, scientists have gone to look at, um, look for these, these signals in uh, sediment cores in, uh, uh, in the ocean and in the lakes and in tree ring records from very old trees. And it turns out that these uh, decadal cycles of warm and cold have been going on for thousands of years. And so it's very normal, it's a cycle. But, it, but as you can see, it goes up and it gets, it's sort of like El Nino, it goes up you know, by a certain amount and then it goes down by a certain amount and it, it's pretty similar amongst all these decades, all these times. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's a little bit more irregular, I think maybe than the ENSO. But, uh, but anyway, it's a very much a fact of life. Um, the difference with, uh, and these are climates, there's other climate cycles. There's the Arctic uh, Oscillation and the, there's the North Atlantic Oscillation and uh, the Antarctic Cycle. So there, you know, there's all kinds of um, sort of cycles that relate to atmospheric, it really begins with atmospheric uh, cycles in circulation of uh, uh, distribution of low pressure, high pressure systems that drive the ocean currents, that drive the upwelling and drive the mixing and the temperatures, et cetera. Um, and then there's the absorption of heat into the water, which, which accounts for things like global warming. Um, with increased air temperatures, a lot of that heat is being sucked into the, into the ocean. And so we're see, we see a trend of, of increasing temperature uh, over this whole entire time period um, with a lot of variability in between. But you can see this is different from these other, these are cycles over here. It gets cold, it gets warm, it gets cold. It's, this is just 
sort of, you know, making its way up. And, and it has retreats, but it's, it's consistently getting higher and higher. And, and then beyond this, there's, um, there are non-cycle changes, non-cyclical, or even trend kind of changes, what we would call unpredictable events or anomalies. We don't really have an explanation. And so we just say, well, we had a warm spell there or a cold spell and we have no good explanation for it. So it was an anomaly. And that's what the blob was that we had experienced here some years ago. So just briefly, you know, uh, for example, so how important is this stuff? Well, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which I know many of you would be familiar with and have heard, you know, lots of talks about its impacts on marine life and, and uh, its influence. We went from a period of a lot colder waters to a lot warmer waters around the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and it stayed warm actually right up to, to the mid 2000s. And then we had another cool spell for another six or eight years. We thought we were going back into a cool phase, but then we had the heat wave from the blob. So it's hard to know recently. You can never really, you need to get 10, 20, 30 years down the road to make sense out of, of the, these kind of data or to you know, really understand what's happening at the time. But um, so this is the typical decay oscillation. And again, it's based on the movements of the, the, the Aleutian low pressure system that's uh, centered at, it, off the Aleutians and it moves from sort of east to west and over time and stabilizes and, and, and changes the currents and, and the uh, energy flow and, uh, uh, and community compositions. And one of the things that it really influences is fish because that kind of long-term change in temperature, you know, most fish are adapted for a specific range of temperatures and they, it's a fairly narrow range. And as the temperatures there warmed, uh, you can see up here in this graphic on the top, there's in the late seventies, it went from being colder than average to jumping up to being warmer than average by quite a bit. We had, you know, overall the change was many degrees centigrade, but it took a while for, um, you know, these temperatures through the entire water column. It, took, it was kind of a gradual increase over 10 years. And during that time, we saw this sort of, you see the disappearance of shrimp here in red was a big uh, signal. And then, uh, uh, and surprisingly, we had a big increase in cod and pollock, which actually favor these warmer temperatures a little bit. And we had uh, a big increase in, in arachnid flounder and other flatfish. Um, we also had, I mean, actually about 40 different species um, uh, changed dramatically during the heat wave. And that accounts for about 98% of the total biomass, about 40 species. Uh, about 20 of them went up and 20 of them went down. And um, so there's a, you know, uh, over the long term, you see capelin here, this second species, the northern shrimp disappeared, the capelin pretty much disappeared, tanner crabs went down, atka mackerel really just disappeared, but pollock and cod and yellowfin sole and uh, squids and uh, took off here. So we had some differential responses. Um, is it good, is it bad? I don't know, we thought it was bad because we were, you know, because more populations were declining and. Puffins were, were, you weren't seeing capelin in their diets anymore. And we you know, thought this would have impact on populations, et cetera. But, well, but it turns out that Pacific cod and juvenile pollock produce a lot of juveniles. And so to some degree, the, the slack, uh, the disappearance of capelin was picked up by the birds. They, they just switched out for juvenile pollock. You have to eat more because they don't, they're lean cuisine compared to capelin, but the birds didn't seem to have a problem adjusting. So, so that, you know, those, that kind of a regime, that was a regime shift of major proportions that affected everything from zooplankton to small fish to large fish and to birds and, uh, and sea lions. And uh, I mean, it seems like an awful lot of animals responded to that, but it took a long time for things to change. It wasn't overnight. In contrast, you know, we had this heat wave of 2014, 15, and you see in this graphic, the top, I mean, it was from, Baja California, all the way up, you know, hundreds of miles offshore and uh, in deep water and down to 400, 500 meters deep was this warm, extra warm water blanket that covered the whole East Coast for, um, and, uh, for, for a full year, but it was actually about a two year period that things were anomalously warm somewhere in this region. So it was really a major, a major impact over a relatively short period of time. And, 
um, uh, just like with that previous example, you can pull out, you know, from, so this is temperatures um, uh, from the Gulf of Alaska during, you know, this whole time period. And you can pull out temperature signals from the Gulf and figure out how much of the signal was due to the global change in sea surface temperature, global warming, how much was due to the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and how much was due to ENSO. And what we see here is that, well, you know, in all cases, there was a, a, a pulse, a peak, a high temperatures because of global warming, high temperatures because of the PDO, and high temperatures because of a fairly strong, but not extreme, uh, ENSO event. Um, if you extract those temperatures out of the signal, um, then you, oops, once you remove those signals from the signal, from the overall signal, then you're, you're left with the residual, okay, what's left, the residual sea surface temperature anomalies. And that's what this graph shows. This is the Gulf of Alaska, and this is the California current system, north, central, and south. So Washington is here, north, central. Um, and what you see here is now, if you get right down to this last little bit, this is when the blob happened. Now, the blob was related to an atmospheric um, uh, set of atmospheric conditions that uh, led to a warming of surface waters in the eastern northeast Pacific, um, a, 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 an unusual atmospheric phenomenon that you know was a, caught everybody by surprise, and it wasn't really they've explained why it happened, but it wasn't something that uh, it's not a totally unexplained event, but it's but it doesn't seem to be a cyclical one, um, and and not, nor one that is like increasing like uh, uh, global warming temperatures. But here it is, and it's a pretty good sized anomaly. Um, uh, in fact, if you look at it, you can see there's been nothing like this in for 140 years. Um, so that was a pretty good sized anomaly. And now remember, this is the anomaly that's just due to the blob. You have to, when you want to see what the total picture was, for that you have to add the El Nino, you have to add the effects of the PDO, and you have to add the effects of global warming. This blob, this, this, then, then the, the temperature uh, change is, is much higher, much higher. So these things all just kind of ganged up like a bunch of rogue waves all gathered together at one time to make a really big wave. And we had this enormous effect. Down in Baja, California, Southern California, we see another so these are, again, these are the anomalies left over after you remove global warming, El Nino, et cetera. Um, and there was a very strong event there too, which was called the Baja event and had its own explanations. We see in Washington and Oregon, Calif Northern California, uh, it was warm. There was warm effect of the blob, but it wasn't anything near what you saw in the Gulf of Alaska. But these were strongly affected by PDO and El, El Nino. And those did raise these temperatures considerably. So, um, so this is just a so this is a way of looking at the residual. This is the uh, the events that you you know we don't have a good record of. They don't they're not predictable. They're not like they're not cyclical, and they're not just going up and up like warming. Um, and it had a major consequences for um, a lot of animals. We lost a lot of animals during this period. We lost a lot of common murres and rhinoceros puffins and tufted puffins. Um, were the first harbingers really um, in the northern parts uh, that um, you know something seriously was wrong. And yeah, I know you've, you've you know, saw the saw the stories on this in the papers, and these have been tracked by lots of people, uh, uh, especially off the coast of Washington, Oregon, California. Um, the Murr, the Murr example, um, you know, was extraordinary. We, we lost a lot of puffins in the Bering Sea, and we lost a lot of rhino puffins in, in the in down off the California, actually off of Washington, Oregon. But um, but Murrs we lost everywhere, and something like sixty two thousand dead and dying Murrs came ashore in in twenty fifteen sixteen, and um, uh, and we estimate that a million you know, to 1.6 million, I think, you know, total were probably killed. And the evidence points to wide-scale starvation. 
So, um, uh, you know, we have to ask about the effect of the, the heat wave on, on the food supply. It always comes back to the food supply. Well, it turns out that if you, you get your hands on forage fish data for, for capelin and sandlance and herring and pollock and cod, uh, and sardines and anchovies, they all declined by, you know, uh, 50 to 95 percent. Not all just with the heat wave, but the heat wave hit them either and brought them down or they were already on their way down. Uh, or they were already pretty low. But however you look at it, uh, a lot of species were all affected at the same time. And you can sort of do a calculation uh, on, you know, how, you know, synchronous that was. And uh, you sort of get a measure, of, it's called a portfolio effect. A colleague of mine at the Mind Research Center sort of developed this, um, this story that the, like, a, like a stock portfolio, you kind of hope that you know if something goes wrong with one stock, it's going to be buffered by another stock. And if you have five or six or seven or ten different stocks, well then you know not having a failure in one or two is not going to sink you. Um, but uh, when all of your stocks do poorly, then you're in trouble. And that's what happened in 2015. All of these forage species crashed at the same time, and it had major uh, implications for the prey species. And um, I won't go into it, but you know, this is, I mean, not only did the numbers of fish decline, but their quality did too. This is whole fish energy. These blue, these are, these are the kinds of sand eels, these age one in, in, in the aquamarine color. Sand eels, um, sand lance, you know, their energy content just plummeted in 2015, 2016. So not only were there fewer fish, they were, they were poor quality. So um, I've, I've, I've see I've gone over my time, so I'm going to wrap this up. But it, it's it's let me just say it's it's complicated, uh, uh, not not too hard to understand, but it's complicated. And and I think for MERS when they died off, we were looking for any one explanation, but it turned out to be all of them. Like there was this there was the forage fish, which are under you know sort of below the birds, and they in their trophic level, and they were the food for the birds. But they were reduced quality and they were less abundant. And on the top side of things, well, you remember what happens when you turn the temperature up. These large predatory fish were suddenly need a lot more on their plates uh, to just live, and they leave less for anybody else. So I think there's competition uh, from the top side and, and poor quality from the bottom side, reduced abundance. These birds uh, stopped reproducing at the colonies, and they um, and a lot of them died. And uh, and, and they don't have a lot of slack because they have to eat so much of their own body mass and fish every day. It hit fast and hard, uh, and uh, you know a lot of birds died in a very short period of time. Uh, I'm just going to pass on that. What does the future hold? Um, well, unfortunately, you know uh, the cycles will continue unless they get uh, you know unless the something sort of uh, interrupts those cycles and they stop functioning the way they do. But we see that warming water temperatures just keep warming. And that's the problem. And that, that, that warming, the models suggest that the increase in temperatures, we're gonna see an increase in the frequency and the magnitude of these heat waves that I just described. Um, and the birds were really the first ones to tell us about it. So uh, what can you do about it? It's, you know, to me, this is kind of how I feel. <laughs> when somebody asks me, what can you do about it? I'm like, oh my God, I, you know, I'm not sure, but, but you can find some, some ideas, or lots of good ideas when you go to your favorite uh, uh, conservation organization, whatever it might be. Uh, lots of organizations that have concrete things that you can do to help stop climate change. And uh, I would say that on the, on, if you want to inform yourself about these cycles and these climate issues. Uh, the, NOAA has a great site with, uh, you know, for every, uh, I would say, stage of complexity that, you know, wh wherever you're coming from. And uh, the International um, Panel for Climate Change also has a lot of great material uh, for every level of expertise to be able to look at and try to understand, you know, what's coming, uh, what's happening and what's happened in the past and what's coming. And so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm over, but I, um, I'll leave it at that. No apologies, John. That was extraordinarily helpful in putting a context for some of the 
the complexity that that we are seeing. So I'm sure you can you can hear the applause from there. Senior research biologist, USGS Alaska Science Center, Dr. John Pyatt. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, wow. I, it, so I am I am deeply honored, and we have already have a few questions in the chat. Um, and lots of great comments about important work. Thanks for your talk. Um, so one question uh, from our board president, Diane Baxter, Seabird's numbers appear dominated uh, by, a resor by resources, food, nesting habitat. Are there any predators or post nesting mortality factors that have a major impact on their numbers? Um, well, it, yes, uh, it, it depends on where you are, uh, but um, but predators, introduced predators have wreaked havoc with seabird populations around the world. And um, uh, in, 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 in many places in the United States and Canada, as you know, you don't have to go very far. The Aleutians were a classic example because they, back in the uh, age 17, maybe even 1800s, you know, um, there was a lot of farming of foxes. And, you know, they were like, well, there's these great islands and they've got all these birds and nobody uses them. So let's put foxes out there and let them breed. And then we'll come and harvest them every year at the end of the summer. And, um, uh, and so there was, they were, they, they farmed foxes, but they didn't have to do any real farming. They just dropped off the male and the female and, you know, came back next year and, or years later and saw what was happening um, and harvested. Uh, well, then that, you know, they sold Alaska and, you know, and suddenly nobody's harvesting. And after a while, nobody was harvesting furs. I mean, I think the trade just fell off, but, but the foxes were still there and they, they really hammered where there were seabird. I mean, the, the bird, the foxes were only put on islands that had seabird populations that could sustain them year round. And so they, yeah, they did terrible havoc and the, and the refuge over decades spent a huge effort getting rid of them from a whole bunch of islands and talk about impact. Man, those islands, those populations bounce back like in a like really incredibly fast because the food was there. You know, the islands was there and it was always a great place, but these darn predators and, and the same is true for rats. They they wreak havoc if they get on these islands, they eat the eggs and the chicks and they can cause a problem anywhere. And uh, they still get invade islands in Alaska they get off of ships, you know, they just, they jump ship, uh, even ones that are just anchored up. So it's really hard to keep rats off. Yeah. So I think the, the whole talk, this was a question that was asked very early on, and I think the whole talk speaks to this, but Paul Eisenhart, hello to Paul. Uh, why do we see so few seabirds in the Gulf Islands and further north? You mean uh, we're talking about the inside waters of um, Georgia Strait, right? Yeah. Um, well, I think I mean it's it it's all about the food, you know. I mean, I I I I don't want to go too far with that, but I think it's um, you know it, distribution abundance of seabirds unless they're limited because of you know some kind of major mortality factor like bycatch um, or even a you know major chronic pollution there aren't many places bycatch is one there can be a, you know if there's been a long standing gillnet fisheries or longline fisheries in a particular area you can you can do some serious damage um, but um, but in general, I don't imagine that that's a problem up there. What else is there? Uh, introduced predators is is a possibility, and, the, and BC has had its share of problems with that too. Uh, that can, I mean, it really can completely just you can take a thriving colony with thousands of birds and and turn it into a wasteland in fairly short order with an invasion by rats or um, you know otters. You know, I know they're cute. But they're vicious predators, and um, and so you know any any one of these predators getting on a bird island. That's why the birds are out there. That's I mean they've they've adapted this strategy of well we won't breed on the mainland. There's too many way too many predators of every stripe. Uh, we'll go to this offshore island where there is none, 
and we, then we can just lay on the ground. We can lay our eggs right on the ground. And, you know, bird predators can get them, but nobody else will. Uh, so that that so there's that. But also, I would think you know it could well be um, it's food supply. You know, forage. Is there you know is there a good forage species base up there? Is there lots of sand lance? Is there lots of herring? Uh, I my guess is no. Got it. Got it. So uh, a comment from Noreen said, excellent talk, left me wishing for more. And that is, that is exactly what we want because tomorrow night there is an opportunity. I think there are just a few slots left for the deeper dive. It's a more conversational tone and uh, with John and taking things kind of to the next level and looking at things a little bit more in detail. So that is tomorrow night and Gabrielle's gonna put the reservation um, link for that in the chat. So if you have some time tomorrow, um, look forward to you joining us, joining us for that. And there are a couple of more questions here. Um, Nancy's asking, what are the long-term impacts for the die-off on mirrors and other offlets? Um, they're enormous. Um, uh, I was going to say, you know, uh, I, I didn't get to it, but with respect to the to the to the regime shift of the late seventies, you know, this happened. The regime shift happened just before the Exxon Valdez oil spill, and um, uh, and and the oil spill killed a lot of adult birds and, and hundreds of thousands, and we and we thought it was a pretty devastating thing blow to MERS and puffins and other species. Um, and then the year after the oil spill, and, and then we found the populations, we went out, we, I mean, collectively a whole bunch of people with many organizations, and found that a lot of colonies numbers were lower than they had been when they were counted during the 70s. And uh, um, when people, there was a big program in Alaska, to, the first time they went out and visited a lot of places and got counts. And it looked like, well, man, there'd been a 40% decline in MERS, you know, after the oil spill. Um, the only problem was after the oils, after I published a paper on that, um, you know, the, there was evidence that, well, you know, there was declines in a whole bunch of colonies that were well outside the spill zone. And there was the reduction in breeding success that some people pointed to and said, that was the oil spill. They're not breeding properly because of the oil spill also happened outside the zone of the oil and in the years afterwards. And, and also the oil kind of, I mean, at least in the pelagic zone disappeared, you know, and so it shouldn't have been continuously affecting these pelagic birds. And yet we saw this continuing effect at the colonies even outside the spill zone. None of it made any sense. It wasn't until, um, that I, I came to the University of Washington for a sabbatical and there was a whole bunch of people there talking about the regime shift and how there'd been this change in oceanography and how the plankton had, do, had shifted in their timing and, and, the, and the various fish had, you know, sort of populations had changed and the salmon had changed completely. You know, salmon catch has changed dramatically. And it was all, this, all these things that happened with this regime shift. Um, I was just the right place at the right time because I, I found somebody who had all this data on fish from Alaska. Uh, he was a guy who works on shrimp and he'd been catching shrimp for years in small mesh nets. So nobody fishes forage fish, but he was fishing for shrimp and he caught capelin and other small forage fish in the net as bycatch, but he kept track of it, you know, and he'd been doing this for decades. And he was, and I heard about it and I re called out, I reached out to him and he sent me some of the data. And I was like, wow, they're not eating. Uh, the capelin just disappeared. And I thought, you know, when I went to Alaska, I was collecting birds and looking at diets, you know, right away. And I, um, I didn't find capelin in anybody. Very rare. And, uh, and I thought, well, gee, what were they eating back in the 70s? So I dug out these old volumes from the OXEP years, the Outer Continental Shelf environmental assessment programs funded by the government. Everybody's eating capelin. Everybody ate capelin. The puffins, both species of puffins, the myrrhs, the merlets, kittiwakes, everybody's eating capelin. It was the most important food. 
and it just disappeared with the regime shift. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, the oil spill, you know, was a deal. And, and, you know, but, and maybe a couple of few hundred thousand MERS died, but there's a million plus in the Gulf and their annual mortality is a hundred thousand anyway. So, you know, it, it happens, it's over. And, you know, they'll, they'll, re, they'll take a few years to recuperate, but they'll be fine. But the regime shift changed everything for decades and, and forage species disappeared for decades. I mean, the impact is not even remotely similar. So these, these ecological changes are last for a while. So to answer your question, uh, with respect to the heat wave, we're studying colonies in Cook Inlet that only last year started to, to start producing chicks again. So um, in 2015, we know from our other observers, and then 2016, 17, 18, 19. So five years at least, the MERS in, in Cook Inlet didn't produce any offspring. Mm. Zero. So it takes five years for a MER to grow up and come back to the colony as an ad breed, to breed as an adult. So it takes five years to like learn the tricks of the trade. And then you come back. Well, this, this year they should be coming back. And, and they replace, you know, of course, the adults, you know, the 10% that die annually, you know, uh, from natural causes and old age, you know, that's those young ones that have got to come in and replace the old ones. Well, there's nothing coming in this year and there won't be next 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 year unless they immigrate from some other colonies and, you know, uh, outside the Gulf. But this impact is enormous. I mean, it's the populations crashed at a whole bunch of colonies and they haven't recovered. And uh, they're not, in a lot of places, they weren't producing chicks for two or three and four years. So uh, the long-term impacts are enormous. I mean, we, we were just talking to some people about maybe trying to do some modeling to figure out what they, quantitatively you know what we think how long it'll be but it's going to be a long time i mean you know this is these are the kind of decadal scale kind of things that are going to take a long time to fix yes um more more questions um let's take a couple more um and john has generously offered to answer any questions that we don't get to this afternoon um, through a direct email. Um, and so we'll be sharing that email. Um, well, it's up on the screen right now. Jay Pyatt at USGS. Thanks to USGS. Um, so um, Elizabeth Lyons wants to know, uh, did the adult puffins have any adverse reactions to researchers holding the babies? Um. Well, they usually don't see it. So, so for one, it's unusual to get an adult in the burrow. I mean, it's not, it's not rare, but it's, it's just, we don't, we don't, when we go to a colony and we spend the morning putting out screens and then picking them up, uh, and then we go off somewhere and, you know, do some grubbing. We only, we only grub a, a, a sort of set number of burrows to just get a sample size. Um, I think we'd be lucky to get one or two adults when we did that, you know. And then when we pull them out, you know, we, we let them go immediately. And, uh, and then we um, reach in and get the, the check and weigh and measure it and put it back. So they don't see it. Um, now, how, would they how do they react to being pulled out of a burrow and, and then released as, um, well, you saw the picture. I mean, they're not happy. They and they have big beaks, and I've got scars, and um, you know they they have their say, and we try to do it as quickly as possible, uh, and just let them go. They come back where we where we've had you know colonies where we've done this much more frequently than one time visits. You know, when you're there at a colony for the whole breeding season, certain burrows that you just recheck and recheck. Um, once the adults have their chicks, you know, they're much more likely to stick around, basically. And the same is true. But once they lay their eggs, but if you, uh, if you handle puffins before they lay, uh, they're, they're inclined to desert. 
or they think, oh, this is not a good place for me to be. There's a predator here. So I'm out of here. But once they've laid a chicken, especially once they, the chick, uh, laid an egg and once they, it, it's hatched, they've invested, it's parental investment. And once they put that much investment into it, they're not as quick to run away. So they'll come back, check it out. Oh, predator's gone and back in they go. So I, I think the impact has been, I mean, over the years by us and thousands of researchers around the world that work on puffins, well, there are about thousands, maybe over time. Um, I think the impact has probably been minimal. Great. Uh, and we'll end with this question and invite people to come to again to tomorrow night's deeper dive. But Nan Evans of Nature Now, always a, an excellent question asker. The IUCN lists our West Coast puffins as being of least concern. Why and do you agree? Um, I, I don't have those the, those facts in front of me at, at the at the moment, but um, I, I you know the actual I know that this, the the state released a report there some time ago, and I uh, had a look at it. I, my work is mostly in Alaska, so um, I I don't keep up as well with what's in my backyard as I should. Um, I think that perhaps you know. The reason is, I mean, the numbers have declined uh, in in um, Washington for sure, and have been for quite some time. I compiled, I think, all the information that was available back in the early '90s, and wrote the Birds of North America account on top to puffins. And at the time, there wasn't a lot for Washington, but there we got together what there was, and it showed a decline that had been going on for 20 years. So the, there's been an ongoing decline, um, and I don't know that it's not anybody's really sure why, but that's mostly been in, in, in I mean, the, the biggest declines were in Puget Sound uh, and Protection Island, for example, and, and the, um, some of the San Juan Islands, there used to be some small colonies and Smith Island. And, you know, a lot of these places, the numbers have just dwindled, um, but they were never great to start with there. Um, I, don't, I don't think there was ever, I mean, we're talking order of magnitude, like 100, hundreds uh, at protection at its best, uh, probably not hundreds even probably, you know, so, but the outer coast, you know, Destruction Island and some of the large colonies offshore, um, I can't remember what the status is of those right now, but they may be, they, maybe they've declined as well, but I don't think it's reached the point of uh, uh, worrying about extinction. The, and the, and the other part of the equation is, you know, what is the, what are the criterion used by the state for deciding whether something is, you know, uh, uh, of concern or not, as, you know, a species of least concern or of no concern. I don't think it's a species of no concern, but it's a species of least concern, a kind of on a hierarchy of things. I think part of the other part of it is that um, for some people, they would say, well, there's, you know, a billion of them up in Alaska. And British Columbia. So, you know, how can it possibly be a threatened species? And they've been increasing, you know, in parts of their range there. So uh, that also comes into it. It's kind of, but, you know, with the marble merlin, they said, we're going to treat the southern populations as discrete from the Alaska ones. So we don't care that they may be doing okay up there. Mm. We're still going to call them, you know, this bird of threatened species down here. But that was a federal distinction at the federal level, they had, they had reasons for making that decision that had to do with jurisdictions of uh, British Columbia, and et cetera. So have I waffled enough on that question? I, I think your response was great, very uh, politic and uh, with some science thrown in there. Um, I'll, I, look that up. I'll look that up for tomorrow's. Okay. So again, I want to thank everybody for participating. We had overall over a hundred people um, join us. So that is um, best over attendance for Zoom, even in this period where I think people are getting a little Zoomed out. Um, I, and I would like to, speaking of Zoom, coming attractions for the Marine Science Center. We have our very own You, Me, and the Salish Sea. Our annual auction is going to be live this year. 
and it is March 4th at 5.30. There should be some great fun. It will be brief. It's about an hour. So that should be um, a good use of your time and a lot of fun and some fun things. And in addition, we are now right now scouring through phase three requirements and regulations and are hoping to be able to resume some of our operations in the not too distant future as uh, we move into phase three on uh, March 22nd. So check out the website at the Marine Science Center for um, visiting the aquarium and the museum in the not too distant future by reservation. And um, this, Dr. John Pyatt, USGS, thank you so much. Um, you were a true friend, the whole family, your, your fabulous family has uh, done so much for the Marine Science Center. Thank you so much. Likewise, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, and you know, anytime you wanna talk about puffins, just give me a call. Okay. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.